Okay, welcome back to this online program. Uh, I'm here with Dr. Nick Gall, uh, Professor Mel Lobo and Professor Leslie Cavi. They're all experts in POTS. Uh, we've discussed in the first part of this program uh, the definition and diagnosis of POTS. In the second part, some conceptual subtypes from uh, Professor Lobo. And now we're going to move on to how POTS sits within uh, a, a condition that has multiple associations. So, Nick. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, so, yes, I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about uh, the comorbidity. So, as Leslie pointed out at the start, um, it is very important to remember that postural tachycardia syndrome is a syndrome, so it's a collection of symptoms. It's not a disease, and therefore, as we've heard, it may be caused by a number of different pathologies, uh, and some of those effects are going to be cardiovascular, and some of those effects are going to be extra cardiovascular. And uh, over on uh, the right-hand side of the slide is a, is a list of symptoms that were derived from a study um, uh, undertaken at the Mayo Clinic. And, and if you look through those, you'll see that there's quite a lot of cardiovascular symptoms, which is why most patients end up seeing cardiologists, uh, but lots of non-cardiovascular symptoms. And I think that it's important to remember that those symptoms are not all going to be caused by the same pathophysiology. Um, I think that has led on to a lot of confusion uh, over the years to say, well, how on earth can this particular patient suffer so many different symptoms? So I think we have to remember that some of the symptoms may well relate to a potential underlying cause. So hypermobility may be relevant, and so some of the symptoms will relate to that condition. Uh, some will be caused by the same pathophysiology. So by that, I mean, if there is a small fibre neuropathy, so damage to small nerve fibres, that will affect blood vessels, but it will also affect bowels and bladder, so it will produce those effects. Uh, some symptoms will relate perhaps to associated conditions, and uh, Professor Lobo touched on mast cell activation. So there may be uh, some allergic and histamine contributors so we have to remember that the symptoms will be a function of all of those uh, three different uh, aspects. And why is that relevant? It's relevant because that then allows us to understand why such apparently disparate symptoms can all link up together. Um, and it also allows us to understand what symptoms are going to improve with what interventions, uh, which other clinicians we may need to get involved, because in the end, this isn't a cardiological condition. This is not something to be managed exclusively in cardiology. Uh, and also, I think that it's important to recognise what are the symptoms where we don't have a direct pathophysiological understanding, and therefore treatments may be complex and may be difficult and may be uncertain, perhaps such as uh, fatigue or brain fog. So we learned quite early on that our patients were multi-systemic and symptomatic, and so we've looked at all of those different symptoms in uh, different ways with different colleagues. And uh, breathlessness is particularly common, uh, but they describe a very specific form of breathlessness often, which is uh, an air hunger, gasping, yawning, a general feeling that there is insufficient oxygen around. Uh, and various testing protocols, particularly cardiopulmonary exercise testing, um, highlighted how dysfunctional breathing patterns uh, were particularly common. Um, we know that that responds very well to respiratory physiotherapy. Uh, and down on the bottom right, which you won't be able to read, but is the Nemegen questionnaire, which is used to diagnose dysfunctional breathing syndrome. Uh, and if you have a little look at that, you'll see how common dysfunctional breathing syndrome symptoms are to POTS. So the question is, is there actually a difference between these two entities? Or in fact, are they um, different physicians describing the same condition. So dysfunctional breathing is common. Uh, many of our patients describe gastroenterological symptoms, uh, and in fact, recent studies have suggested that there is quite a correlation between POTS and gastro gastroenterology symptoms. Um, many will essentially lump all of these symptoms into irritable bowel syndrome, uh, but essentially uh, what seems to be the case is uh, some level of dysfunction uh, at any level of the gut. So it may be esophageal dysmotility, it may be gastroparesis, it may, may be colonic dysmotility. Um, so rather than 
expecting that there is some dramatic gastroenterological illness, we usually find that it's dysfunction. Uh, and then it often requires a, a, a helpful gastroenterologist to recognize those. Uh, there are many simple therapies. Um, and uh, often the challenge is uh, being in a situation where those simple therapies can be offered to the patients. So gastroenterology is, is uh, very important for us. So urology is also important, and we find in a similar way uh, a common presentation of, of a rather neuropathic bladder. Um, so, so bladders are often rather weak, uh, large, producing poor pressure. So patients often uh, describe frequency, urgency, and incontinence. Uh, although they may also describe recurrent pain and urinary infections. And uh, essentially, we've found two different patterns, uh, either the neuropathic bladder um, or a rather infected histamine-laden uh, bladder, which is then more painful and irritable. Uh, so in those situations, management with our urological colleagues uh, focuses on ensuring that the bladder is empty, uh, antibiotics when needed, and also antihistamines. Um, a small number of patients end up self-catheterizing because the bladder really doesn't work properly. Um, we work quite commonly and closely with neurology, but, but at a number of different levels. So most POTS patients will describe migraine. Uh, it's really not entirely certain as to why they so frequently suffer migraine, but as again with this condition, managing the symptoms is so important. It's not necessarily just a question of making the diagnosis and saying, yes, you have migraines or, or excluding something unpleasant, but it's a question of allowing them to be treated for those migraines. Uh, we find, interestingly, vestibular migraine is particularly common, and that then adds to some element of confusion because uh, the patients then describe widespread forms of dizziness, uh, which you have to unpick. Uh, sleep disturbance is very common, uh, and the classical form of that is something called psychophysiological insomnia, uh, where patients just find it very, very difficult to get off to sleep uh, or to stay asleep. Um, we're increasingly recognising uh, symptoms associated with a small fibre neuropathy. So this is a uh, nerve damage affecting just very small nerve fibres, which are very difficult to diagnose without biopsy or sympathetic microneurography, very easy to miss on standard conduction studies. Uh, but this causes pain and it causes the organ dysfunction. And in fact, the more we look, the more we find and the more we realise that actually potentially a large proportion of POTS is in fact the cardiovascular manifestations of a small fibre neuropathy. Uh, as is often the case, patients uh, are very concerned about many other conditions uh, and often we work with neurology to exclude and reassure ourselves that we're not missing some of these other more significant problems. Uh, we work with rheumatology. Many of our patients uh, have a, a, a hypermobility. Um, there remains some controversy as to uh, the importance and relevance of hypermobility, although there is no doubt that many of our patients are hypermobile and appear to have many symptoms from that. Uh, there's no doubt that if you speak to POTS patients, many are hypermobile. And if you speak to hypermobile patients, many have POTS-like symptoms. We don't necessarily think that they're the same condition, but there is clearly an overlap. Um, we work with rheumatologists to exclude inflammatory arthritis, uh, but also um, work with rheumatology to, to essentially manage our patients um, to help them with their uh, joint symptoms, with physiotherapy, with pain management, uh, and so forth. There's obviously a very small number of our hypermobile patients where there is then concern of about a, a, a more significant and serious Ehlers-Danlos syndrome variant. Um, most of the time, our patients are um, hypermobile, but in the, in inverted commas, benign form, which may produce lots of symptoms, but is not uh, dangerous. Uh, but there are rarer forms, um, and this is a list created by the genetics team at Guy's uh, for the sort of things that they would be concerned by uh, and would wish to see in their genetics clinic. Uh, we used to refer everybody to genetics, but uh, there's too many hypermobile patients out there. So these are the, uh, the concerning features to consider genetics review. Mast cell activation syndrome has been covered by Mel or, or mentioned by Mel, and it's very complex 
it is to some extent controversial. Uh, there are very few experts. Um, where it fits in remains difficult. Uh, there are certainly some thoughts that excessive histamine production will contribute to symptoms, will contribute to the pathophysiological process. However, um, there are many uncertainties um, in the area and often uh, I'm afraid we uh, will end up taking a rather pragmatic empirical view of if you feel better taking antihistamines then so much the better but it's, it's difficult to progress from there uh, although no doubt we will learn more in the future. So uh, thank you for listening. Over to you Andrew. Thanks Nick. Um, so, Leslie, this explains why we're uncertain about the incidence. This is a vast array of symptoms and organ systems. And who knows how many patients are sitting in these clinics uh, with unexplained GI upset, unexplained neurology, unexplained psychiatric symptoms. And they perhaps fall under this umbrella of POTS. Yeah, I mean, um, I quite often I've been um, working in different environments and I quite often find that there are people who've been batting around the healthcare system for years and years with these symptoms and never really um, achieving any sort of um, diagnosis. I think often I find it's um, sort of as a GP, I quite often find that people have severe IBS or undiagnosed GI symptoms. They have um arthropathy of unknown cause in their notes and then they either have lightheadedness or syncope um, and if you start digging a li little deeper when you see that triad and um, you quite often find pots at the end of the day and usually something else like uh, for example the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes that Nick mentioned. Uh, and uh, Mel what's your feel for the true incidence of this? Do you think there is an epidemic of pots out there that's just being undiagnosed or uh, or do you think uh, that there is a hard core of patients who present a lot to um, healthcare systems and we've got, we've got most of them in our healthcare system somewhere, we just need to put the right diagnosis on them? Yeah, probably the uh, latter, Andrew, in the sense that probably not an epidemic out there, but if we were to increase uh, reporting and, and, and awareness uh, of this condition, we might see that the prevalence rate is, is higher than we currently Recognise, and that's certainly been reported in uh, Northern Europe. I think in uh, Denmark, uh, there's just increased awareness, increased use of uh, tilt testing, increased access to healthcare for younger people who are, you know, getting investigated now when they may not have been in the past. Um, I mean, when one considers the fact that uh, there are various uh, well-recognised triggers for this that include um, per uh, you know, periods of um, infection, viral infection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then, then you know, if people are alert to this. We, we, we might see we might see more. And I mean, to be very contemporary in the setting of coronavirus, I've seen quite a few patients presenting with some symptoms of orthostatic intolerance and neurological dysfunction post uh, COVID nineteen is now uh, well recognised. Other than the classic anosmia agesia uh, findings, so I, I don't think that there's a tidal wave. But there are a lot of these patients out there who are being missed because people aren't putting together the pieces for understandable uh, reasons. Yeah, Nick, I think there's going to be a lot of patients out there uh, who uh, will be interested in this association. And uh, would you advise them to just do a standing test themselves, measure their own heart rate response, or is that uh, potentially dangerous? <laughs> um, an interesting question. I, I think that there is, so I, I actually do ask patients to do postural stand tests at home um, because it gives us an idea. Um, and particularly with our long weights, uh, it allows us to start to get some idea. So 10 minutes of lying flat and minutely heart rates and blood pressures and then 10 minutes of standing. Um, I, I think, so that is interesting. I, I think um, with Leslie's, point about the Canadian guidelines where there is um, postural tachycardia without symptoms. So I think there are, there are, there are patients out there who, uh, who have a tachycardia that don't have symptoms who won't fit into POTS. Uh, there are patients out there who have POTS symptoms but don't fulfill the criteria. So there is some complexity. Um, and I think that we're probably all experiencing uh, patients using uh, monitoring systems 
um, Apple Watches, Cardia system, mm. oximeters, uh, without perhaps necessarily understanding the the foibles of those devices. So uh, I think that there's that there is some danger also to creating. Uh, the worried well, uh, as it were, who then have to have physiological findings explained. So, so yes, I think it's helpful in in certain cases, but not necessarily applicable to all. Yeah, I think we're all seeing Apple Watch derived referrals at the moment. I think there's a mm. lot of them about. Okay, we're going to close this section of the program, and we're going to move on to the management of pots in the next session. <laughs>